Well, good morning to you. Um, Thank you for being here, uh, both on site and online as part of our Good Friday service. It is a delight to see so many people and it's a delight to see you um, on the live stream as well. We're so glad that you have made this time to come and celebrate and acknowledge and remember the day that Jesus died. So just a few reminders before we begin in worship. Government restrictions have lifted, so now we can sing without masks. Um, If you're at home, you've always been able to do that, lucky you. But just for those who are here, no more uh, masks are required, so um, feel free to join in in worship. A couple of other things, if you've got children with you, or you just really like colouring in, there's some little packs at the back, and uh, you're very welcome to help yourself uh, to a little pack. There's a few little special... um, foil items with something sweet in them as well for parents to give out to their children if they think that's appropriate. So um, why don't I pray for us as we begin this service. So will you pray with me, church? Lord Jesus, we come before you today and acknowledge that you are the mighty King, that you have done for us what no one else could do, that you have made a way for us to be part of your family, to be friends with God, so that can be with you. We can be with you now and forever. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Please stand. I'm gonna sing a few songs this morning.
give thanks for what you did on that cross. It's the perfect example of love that we can take away and adapt to our own lives. And Lord, we come expectant this morning. We come ready to learn, to be regenerated, to be refilled. Lord, we come with ready hearts, open hearts. invite your spirit here this morning in our lounge rooms and in this building Mm. and God's people said Amen Thanks, Jav. Thanks, team. It's so great to be able to um, come together and worship the Lord um, and also do that from home or wherever you're watching the live stream from as well. Well, if you didn't meet me before, my name is Roxanne Lawler and I am one of the associate pastors here at Gaimia Baptist Church. Uh, Great to see you. I hope you've had a very warm welcome already, Uh, but you are very welcome uh, here and we're glad that you are joining us online as well. Uh, It's going to be a fantastic service this morning. We've got a lot to do. We have been looking at the story of Easter through the lens of the Australian bush, which is Sounds a bit strange, sounds a bit unusual, uh, but we've been having a bit of a bushfire motif run through our Easter uh, season and looking at how the Australian bush regenerates uh, so beautifully 
after a fire has swept through it. And we're looking at that as a bit of a metaphor for our lives. Uh, so that's kind of been our theme over Easter and hence you'll see the uh, little regeneration um, patch there coming up on the screen. Uh, if you haven't heard any of the sermons before, they're all available on podcasts. So let me encourage you to get onto that. And we will be continuing this theme on Easter Sunday. So we've got uh, four options for you on Easter Sunday if you don't have somewhere to go or, or listen in um, already. So we'll be here on site at 8.30 and 10.30. We have an online service at 9.30 in the morning and then of course our 6 p.m. service. So if you don't already have plans for Easter Sunday uh, and you don't have a church and you just sort of found yourself here at Good Friday and you'd like to see what the sequel is to uh, Good Friday because this is part one and uh, Easter Sunday is part Part two, spoiler alert, he comes back. Um, so let me encourage you to, to get on to that Easter Sunday service at one of those places. So we are going to continue with our service. I'm going to invite Rhonda Montgomery, who is one of our elders, to come and lead us in prayer. After that, we're going to have Matt Willis, who is our other associate pastor. He's going to read the Bible. And then Mark Rader, who's our senior pastor, will be bringing us the word. So thanks, thanks Rhonda. Good morning, my church family. I'm excited to be here. It's been a year since I've been up here, so it's lovely to just be back together again, isn't it? Just praise God for this opportunity to worship on this significant day. Will you pray with me? Our Lord and our God, we thank you that we have the freedom in our country to gather here and remember and reflect on the love that led you to be hung on a cross on Calvary. And it is our prayer that we will open the eyes of our heart, Lord. We want to see you. We really want to see you for who you are, our suffering Lord. As you took on our sin and paid the ultimate price with your son's life, demonstrating that there are no limits on your love for us. Oh, what a saviour. We're reminded of the words in Isaiah which tell us, you were despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And Lord, we can't get our heads around what that meant. But Lord, we just thank you that you saw your love for us to take you to the cross and to bear our sorrows, the pain, the humiliation, the injustice of your crucifixion, of your son's crucifixion, is hard for us to understand and fully know. But we do know that because of his cruel sufferings, that he knows and identifies the pain we carry. He knows when our world is rocked by tragedy and grief and pain. And we know your son experienced agony, fear, loneliness, abandonment. Your son knew that in this life we would have trouble, but his hope was beyond this world and beyond earthly experience. His hope was in your love. We thank you that Jesus' compassion and love for us moved him to carry our sorrows to the cross. So Father, we ask today we can lay all of our sorrows at the foot of that cross today. We see in your word that your death and resurrection demonstrate your power to transform even, the most, transform even the most hopeless situations and bring new life out of despair. Forgiveness at the cross means fresh starts. They're always possible. So we look to you today for your transforming power to continue changing our lives. We thank you that our Father, the cross does not mean the end with horror, but with victory with promise of hope and restoration in your future kingdom. And we give you thanks and glory and honour for who you are, for what you have done, and for the future that awaits us. And it's in the powerful, wonderful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. Get my Bible out of my arms. 
The reading today is from the Gospel of John, chapter 19, starting at verse 28. Later, knowing that everything had been finished and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I'm thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now it was the day of preparation and the next day was to be a special Sabbath because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath. They asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Thanks, Matt. Oh, good morning. It's good to have you here uh, in the building. And for those of you who are watching online, trust that this is not um, something that you're watching, but something that you're able to, to participate in. And whether you are at home on your lounge or here, I'd encourage you to have the reading with you and a Bible with you if you've got it, because we're going to be looking at a handful of passages uh, that John alludes to here. Um, our theme for uh, Easter has been regeneration. Uh, and uh, I've been pretty fascinated by what I've been learning about bushfire regeneration. Normally, of course, when bush fires hit the news, they're in the news because property and people are in danger, uh, and that's not a good thing. Uh, and uh, so we tend to pay attention to the work uh, to protect uh, properties and people and those sorts of things, as it should be. But we do know, kind of from an ecological perspective, right, we know that bushfire actually has a purpose. That's not just to burn down houses and property, but there's a purpose to what bushfires do that help bring about regeneration, right? We're all familiar with this. We probably studied it in school or something and drew things in bits and pieces, but fires, their purpose is not just to burn and destroy, right? But in, the, uh, in, in kind of taking out the, um, the undergrowth, it allows regeneration, by uh, re kind of reducing the canopy, it also allows sunlight to hit the forest floor. Uh, by destroying non-native plants, uh, it allows the native plants to regenerate in their place. It takes care of uh, some, some diseased trees. It takes care of insects. The heat and the smoke are instrumental in bringing about the germination of certain seeds and plants, and on and on it goes. So the purpose of a, of a bushfire is not just to burn. It actually, in, in its burning, of course, meets a whole bunch of conditions that allow the bush to regenerate. You follow me on that? Uh, pretty standard ecology. I'm not going to go any further because that's all I really know about bushfires and their purpose, uh, having never studied them in school because I was in Canada. Um, but uh, there, there's something I think quite significant about the preconditions to something else. And it has to do with the nature of prophecy. I don't know if you kind of heard in John's account that Matt just read for us, how many prophecies John refers to. There are three of them in this reading alone, where he just wants to draw attention to the fact that, hey, Jesus fulfilled these prophecies. But we need to understand something really important about prophecies before we have a look at them. And that is that the fulfillment of the prophecy is not the end of the prophecy. Now, the whole idea is not just for Jesus to kind of have wandered through his life ticking things off so he could be the world record holder for most prophecies fulfilled, right? As if the idea was that he, he managed to tick all those boxes, the fulfillment of prophecy is not just about ticking the boxes, but it's about fulfilling the conditions for a new reality to become true. 
I don't know how many of you have read the Harry Potter series or watched the movies. That was kind of the the best example I could think of off the top of my head uh, about a a series of prophecies. But Harry Potter is a child of prophecy. Uh, and, And the whole point of him fulfilling those prophecies is not just so he can stand there at the end of the book and say, I fulfilled all the prophecies. Here's my checklist. I got them all. Like prophecy, bingo. Just like that. Done. How good am I? The fulfillment of the prophecies enabled the ending of a great evil and the establishment of a new period of peace. So when Jesus fulfills prophecies, our first reaction should not just be to say, oh, isn't that great? Another one we can cross off the list. It's actually to ask ourselves, in the fulfillment of these prophecies, what conditions are being met that open a new possibility moving forward. So much like a bushfire has a purpose beyond the fire itself, it actually opens the door for regeneration. What what has Jesus accomplished here? And and what does it point to? What's the new reality that it points to? And so what I want to do in the time that we have this morning is to actually spend a little bit more time delving into these three prophecies. Because John's uh, description of them is a little bit indirect. He tells us what's fulfilled, but he doesn't actually point necessarily to what the condition, uh, what, what it opens up or makes possible. And so I actually want to delve into these passages just a little bit more in order to paint the picture of what Jesus' death has made possible for us. So if you have your Bibles, whether a, f- a physical copy that's, that you've got next to you on the lounge or next to you here or a, a digital copy, grab that out. We're going to have a bit of a look at this text. So let me draw your attention to the first prophecy that Jesus is said to fulfill here. Uh, Verse 28, later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. Now, on its own, that doesn't really tell us too much, does it? It just kind of goes, okay, he was thirsty, and apparently, apparently that was a prophecy that was fulfilled. But scholars believe that this is referring, in fact, to Psalm 69. So if you have your Bibles, turn back to Psalm 69. Now, Psalm 69 um, uh, has a number of, um, I think, parallels with the life of Jesus. And they're important for us just to identify them so that we can make some sense of why this statement of I am thirsty is important. So let me draw your attention to the very first verse of Psalm 69. It kind of gives us the, the big picture of the psalm, the why of the psalm. And it says, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in the miry depths where there is no foothold. I have come into the deep waters. The floods engulf me. So there's a psalm that is spoken by, written by, prayed by those who are experiencing an overwhelming circumstance where they need the rescue of God. But if you go down a little bit to verse 7, you get a slightly... um, a slightly more nuanced perspective, because this is what the psalmist goes on to say. For I endure scorn for your sake, and shame covers my face. I'm a foreigner to my own family, a stranger to my own mother's children, for zeal for your house consumes me, and the insults of those who insult you fall on me. So this is not just someone who's found themselves in trouble. This is someone who has found themselves in trouble for the sake of the Lord. That what they are experiencing is not just because they did something silly or foolish or they've been sinful or wicked or made a mistake. No, no, no. They actually endure scorn for the sake of God. If you you skip forward just a little bit and go down to verse 26 of the same psalm, it says this about his persecutors, because it gets more focused. It's not just that I'm in danger, and it's not just that I'm in danger for your sake, but those who oppose him, listen to what he's, how he describes them, for they, my enemies, persecute those you wound and talk about the pain of those you hurt. So the the psalmist here goes beyond saying, I'm in trouble, oh God, save me, to saying, I am in trouble because you have 
put me in trouble. I have been faithful to all you have called me to, and yet I'm experiencing this hardship, this scorn, this mockery. Save me from that. And then in the midst of the psalm, we have where this prophecy seems to be fulfilled. If you have a look in verse 19, you know how I am scorned, disgraced, and shamed. All my enemies are before you. Scorn has broken my heart and left me helpless. I looked for sympathy, but there was none. For comforters, but I found none. They put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. That last reference, the second part of verse 21, they gave me vinegar for my thirst, seems to be what John is referring to in, in chapter 19. Now, you'd have to say it's a bit of an obscure part of the psalm to draw out. Apart from the fact that Jesus was thirsty and they gave him wine vinegar, it's a little bit strange. But this is where the context makes some sense for us. That Jesus, in, in, in acknowledging his thirst, right, ticking the box of the prophecy, being given this vinegar, this wine vinegar to drink, he's actually, in the biggest sense of the word, he is identifying with the faithful servants of God who faces scorn and opposition and mockery because he is doing the will of God. John makes us work for it a little bit, doesn't he? This is exactly like Jesus, can I just say. In the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke in particular, Jesus is always speaking in parables. And if you remember why, it's to make people think. (laughs) It's to make people work at stuff. So when Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like... And then he makes some, tells some story. We're supposed to ask ourselves, how is the kingdom of heaven like some yeast that got worked through the dough? Like, seriously, what's the, what's the connection? We're meant, we're meant to work. And John makes us work a little bit. But Jesus has identified himself with the faithful sufferer. The one who is suffering not because they've done something wrong, but in fact because they are doing the will of God. That's the first thing that John draws our attention to. Jesus has fulfilled Scripture, and he has not just kind of done, yes, I was thirsty, tick. He has also identified his entire work. What he's about to say when he says, it is finished, the work that is finished is the work of God, the will of God, what he was sent to do. The question is, what is that work? And this is where John gives us two more clues. If you go back in John 19, after Jesus dies, John tells us some details that the other Gospels don't include, and that is of the breaking of the legs of the other two thieves and the fact that Jesus was already found to be dead. But at the end of that little interlude, John says in verse 36, these things happened so that the Scriptures would be fulfilled. And the first Scripture that he refers to is, not one of his bones will be broken. And now you may have a little textual note in your Bible. In my Bible, it's a little letter C. And if you have a look at the bottom, it says that comes from Exodus 12, verse 46. So, guess where we're going? If you have your Bibles, turn to Exodus chapter 12. We'll have a quick look at what this prophecy is that Jesus has fulfilled in this instance. And again, we're required to work a little bit at this one. Because if you have a look in chapter 12 of of, uh, the book of Exodus, and just start at verse 43, because that's where this whole section starts, and it's Passover restrictions. So it's how the Passover is to be eaten. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, these are the regulations for the Passover meal. No foreigner may eat it, any slave you have bought may eat it after you've circumcised him, but a temporary resident or a hired worker may not eat of it. It must be eaten inside the house. Uh, Take none of the meat outside the house. Do not break any of the bones. Now, what did you notice about that? I mean, apart from the fact that the stuff you probably didn't know about Passover, because we tend not to celebrate the Passover meal, that doesn't talk anything about a future Messiah, does it? It's just how to eat the Passover meal, which is interesting when you consider that John sees this as a significant fulfillment of Scripture. Now, what John seems to be doing is he's identifying again. So Jesus has identified already with the faithful servant who is suffering for the will of God. 
And here, what's the parallel? Well, Jesus is the Passover lamb. Right? John takes this, this moment where Jesus' legs are not broken and says, this is the identification with the Passover lamb. If you have your Bibles, John chapter 1. It's a lot of work for a Friday morning, isn't it? John chapter 1, <clears throat> starting in verse 29. This is where it gets confusing. I wish there were more names in the Bible sometimes. The next day, John, this is John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming towards him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, biblical scholars, if you were to take some time to study John chapter 1, biblical scholars argue about what John means here, both John the gospel writer and John the Baptist. Because the thing about the Passover lamb is it had nothing to do with sin. The Passover lamb was not actually a sacrifice. It was dinner. You were to kill the, the, the lamb and you were to eat the lamb. You didn't need a priest to make that, uh, to, to, to kill the lamb because it wasn't a sacrifice. It was a meal. But it was a really significant meal, wasn't it? Because it was the meal that launched the people of God from slavery into freedom. It set them free in this radical way and cr becomes for them the, kind of their independence day. It becomes the kind of the day that they were formed as a nation when God, with a mighty hand, fulfilled his promises and brought them out. And John the Baptist combines their, this experience of Passover with the sin of the world. These, these ideas being combined might seem like a bit of a stretch in chapter 19. But Jesus here in chapter 19 is certainly identified as the Passover lamb, the one who was sacrificed, the one who was killed to set us free. This is what's implied here. This is where we turn to the last one, John chapter 19. Then hopefully this will all kind of make some sense, right? John chapter 19 again, verse 37. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. And again, your Bible may have a little textual note, uh, seeing as it's right after the previous one, it's a little letter D in my Bible, and it refers to Zechariah chapter 12. Turn with me to Zechariah chapter 12. It's the second last book in the Old Testament. It's a text that was written to the people of Israel after they had gone through one of the most devastating circumstances in their history, and an opportunity for God to pitch forward about this glorious future. But if you have a look in chapter 12, verse, uh, verse 10, it says this. The Lord has, has he's just been speaking about how he is going to make the city of Jerusalem this rock uh, and, and will use it to judge the nations. And then says in verse 10, And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child. Now again, John's use of that passage in John chapter 19 is a little bit strange, isn't it? Because the Jewish leaders aren't looking on Jesus and mourning for him, are they? They're looking on Jesus to make sure he's dead so they can kind of move the bodies on and kind of celebrate Passover without any more complications. But have a look at how the rest of this passage follows on. After the, after the prophet speaks about the weeping that will take place, chapter 13, verse 1. Uh, chapter divisions were added to our Bibles in the Middle Ages. I think it was the uh, 13th century that they were added in. Sometimes they're perfectly placed. Sometimes it's a little bit questionable. I wonder about the placement of chapter 13. Because look how it follows on. Verse 1. On that day... The day when God will pour out on the house of David a spirit of supplication and grace. The day they will look on the one that they have pierced. On that day, a fountain will be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. And now, I think we have a more complete picture of what Jesus has fulfilled 
in John chapter 19. That John's interest is not just to say, oh, look, Jesus was thirsty, cross that one off. Oh, look, uh, they didn't break his bones, cross that one off. Oh, look, they looked on the one they had pierced, cross that one off. Because those prophecies fulfill the conditions that open a new future for people. And do you see how John has painted this new future for us? Jesus' death has not just been the fulfillment of prophecy. It has been the fulfillment of prophecy to make sure that everything that needed to be done in order to introduce the new future has been done. It's like anything that we engage in where there's a list of things to do before we can experience the good. We've all done them, haven't we? We've all moved houses you got a list of stuff to do. The point is not just to get through the list, although getting through the list is helpful. Why do you get through the list? To enjoy your new home. So you turn off the power in the old place, so you're not still paying for that, and you turn the power on in a new place. There is a list. Turn the power on. Tick, well played. But the purpose is to enjoy your new home. You've all gone on holidays, maybe not in the last year, but you've all gone on holidays. You vaguely remember what it was like to go someplace. You had a list. You had a list of things. I got to pack this, get that passport, get that visa, sort this out, work out the accommodation. All of those sorts of things have to happen. But the list is not what we're at stepping into, is it? You don't get to your first day of holidays and say, wow, we did great on our list. We got it all done. There's nothing left. The whole point is to enjoy the holiday. When John points out what Jesus has fulfilled, it is not just so we can go, wow, he fulfilled a lot of stuff. It's in order that we might ask ourselves, why did he fulfill those things? What future is made possible by the fulfillment of these prophecies. And it is a glorious future, isn't it? The good news of Jesus' death is that in his death, he has completed all that is necessary for you and I to enter into a new future. A future where we are following the one who suffered according to the will and plans of God. The one who has created a fountain that is made available for you and for me in order that our sin and our impurity might be washed away. He has fulfilled the conditions so that you and I can leave behind our life of slavery and of bondage and of hard work and step into freedom and opportunity as the new people of God. The death of Jesus is not just an interesting historical fact. The fulfillment of the prophecies is not just an interesting list of things that Jesus managed to do in his life. It is the establishment, the fulfillment of all the conditions so that we can enter into new life. Jesus fulfilled the whole list of vacations so that we can enter into our holiday. He has fulfilled everything we have to do so that we can enjoy the new home. He has finished everything that needs to be done in order that we can step into a new full life. As bushfires do a whole bunch of stuff ecologically, as they do all sorts of good work, the point of those, the good work, the purpose is to bring about regeneration. Jesus' death has been meant to fulfill the conditions so that we can live a full life. This is the invitation. This is the invitation. And I trust that as you are here, whether you're on site, whether you're in your lounge room, 
Whether you are joining us for the first time as a guest this morning, whether you've been around for a long time, whether you've been following Jesus for, uh, for decades and you have placed your faith in him, or whether you're only just beginning to try to figure out who Jesus is and what that actually means for your life, here is the invitation to step more fully, more securely, more committedly into the new life that Jesus has made possible in his death. Good Friday is always a little bit tricky because there is, as Rock said, a part two. There's, there's something even better on the horizon because not only has Jesus' death fulfilled the conditions to make new life possible, but his resurrection has made that life, well, present tense. But that's for Sunday. Right here, right now. If you look at your life, and you think to yourself, I could use a better future. Jesus has fulfilled the conditions for that better future. John asks us to, to work at this a bit. Jesus always invited curiosity always urged people to ask questions, to, to step in, to wrestle with what he had to say. Can I invite you to wrestle with what Jesus has to say? To step more fully into the life that he has made possible through the fulfillment of prophecy. In just a moment, I'm going to invite Job and the team to come. They're going to lead us in a, in a new song. We've already picked up some of the language of Revelation, and this song picks up some similar language, speaking about how the Lamb is worthy. And can I just point out that as, just before we learn this song, or sing it if you're familiar with it, with it that the worth of the Lamb is, is, is kind of similar to the prophecies because of all that Jesus has done and all that he has suffered and all that he has undergone, he is therefore made worthy to, as we'll sing, to open the scroll of God, the plans and purposes of God for his people, plans of blessing and protection and provision and assurance and salvation. Jesus is worthy. So let us step into that invitation. So as the team come, let me lead us in prayer. And then we'll introduce this song to you as we conclude our service. Would you join me? Lord Jesus, thank you for, um, thank you. <laughs> thank you that you have fulfilled all the conditions for us to enter into and experience new life. Thank you for uh, the fact that you, as the faithful one, who fulfilled the will of God and suffered for his sake, fulfilled the purposes and will of the Father, even in going to the cross, that in so doing, you have established for us a pattern for our own lives. We thank you that you are our Passover lamb, not only who symbolizes for us the freedom that we have in you, the freedom that has been made available for us, the opportunity for us to leave bondage behind and step into freedom with you, but also that you are the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And that we can enter into a new relationship with you where all of our impurity, all of our sin, everything that separates us from you can be washed away in the fountain that you have made available. And we thank you that you are worthy. The slain Lamb, worthy to open the scroll is in the hands of the one who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever. The plans and purposes for us, the establishment of your kingdom and our place within it. And I ask Holy Spirit that as we hear this song, as we reflect over this weekend, that we might be those who take up the invitation to consider and to experience the new life that you have made possible in your death and resurrection. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Can I invite you all to stand? This song is a little bit different. It's a question and answer song. So the way this will go is I'll ask a question and everyone answers. The lyrics will be on the screen. 
And then in the chorus, we all come and sing together. You'll see how it goes.
pray with me. Lord Jesus, you are worthy. You are the only one, Lord God. There is no other name on this earth through which salvation is possible. Thank you, Lord, that you not only fulfill the requirements, but you invite us to step into this new future, this new reality, which doesn't start then, but it starts now. Lord, I pray we can step into this with you, that we can be people whose whole hearts are turned to you, that we can say thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus, for what you accomplished on that cross. And thank you that we benefit, that you did it for us because you love us. And Lord, I pray that every person here, both on site and online, turns their eyes to you and that we turn our hearts to you in thankfulness and we receive what it is you have for us. And together we step into that new future. We step into that new reality. All the goodness that you have planned for us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Why don't you have a seat, church? If you're at home, you might already be sitting. <laughs> well, that concludes our Good Friday service um, for this year. Don't forget, Sunday is coming, the part two. So if you don't have a service already, we would love to welcome you both here on site or online. Um, just um, as you go, um, be blessed. Have a wonderful week. Hold what you have heard today and learnt in your heart. Um, sometimes at, at church we, we do an offering as well, but we've stopped doing that because of COVID. We don't pass the bags um, and a lot of people have started giving online. So thank you for those who, who give to the work of the church here online. Um, we have what's known as a retiring offering, um, which is uh, one of our stewards will we'll have a collection bag at the back. And if you would like to participate with what God is doing here at Guymere Baptist Church and you're on site and you don't give electronically, please uh, feel free to avail yourself of that opportunity. Uh, if you are watching the live stream, there's actually a little button, a click, uh, give button, I think it is, that you can click to, to give that way. Um, but church, have a wonderful and safe Easter. It's been a delight to be with you and go with Jesus. Amen.